Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special week of Collider Nightmares. It feels so good to say that. Uh, I am your spooky host, Clark Wolf. Thank you all so much for joining us. So Collider Nightmares is coming back for a week of uh, Halloween episodes to get you ready for October 31st. And of course, it's not just going to be me sitting here yelling about the Universal Monster reboots. I have a panel who's going to yell with me. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go ahead and introduce them. To my left is Miss Perry Nemeroff. Oh, I'm so, this feels so right. It just feels so right to be back here. I feel like I've been hoarding all my horror goodies for so long, and now I'm going to demon vomit them all over the table for you guys to have. I'm so happy we're back this week. I'm so happy that you're demon vomiting. <laughs> and to her left, we have Mr. John Schnepp. Hello, I'm so happy to be back <laughs> for this very special nightmare. So precious, be careful with the microphone. <laughs> yes, indeed, we have let both John Schnepp and Precious out of their boxes. And to my right is my partner in crime, Mr. Mark Riley. Oh, thank you, Clark Wolf. Uh, it's so good to be here. It feels like not a day has passed. Actually, it feels a long time since you've done this, but... <laughs> Man, is it good to be back. Happy Halloween, everyone. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yay, panel, and happy Halloween to you. So, all right, speaking of the time that we have been off, this has been a huge year in horror. And so I wanted to start by a little debate slash discussion. I think that in the genre world, in the genre community, we talk a lot about, oh, this year, you know, indie horror was so much better than studio horror, or, or this, you know, but this mainstream movie, like, really broke out. And I got to say... I, I feel like this year has been an insane year for horror movies. Um, it's no secret to you guys that it crushed at the box office, Get Out, um, all these, all these movies. But there have been. I wanted to put it to you guys first. Have there been a lack of? sleeper indie hits. So for instance, I'll throw an example out there. It Comes at Night, right? Perry, I know you loved It Comes I at did. Night. I hated it. Mm. Uh, but either way, I feel like this year we didn't really have a Babadook or an It Follows or something that just came out and blew the doors mm -hmm. off. So where are you guys at with that? Feel free to jump in. Yep. I don't know. I think maybe uh, movies like Get Out in particular might have stolen that thunder because when we talk about studio horror, normally we talk about the big studios like Warner Brothers, let's say, which had it. Blumhouse isn't on that level, so I'm still looking at Blumhouse as an independent production company. And when I think about the movies you named, like Babadook, The Witch, those were very, or they were original they're original pieces and they're sleeper hits and they're hits that stick with us because they were completely original and when i think about get out it falls into that category and it falls into the category of not being made by one of the major studios so i actually think get out might have earned that title this year gentlemen yeah. wow that's a, that, you know what it feels very independent but i at least get out does but i i clump it in a studio release because it had uh the backing of um universal Am I correct in that? So yeah. the fact that they released it the way they did and then the word of mouth spreading, it just ignited the horror community. It became one of the, the highest grossing movies of, of the year. So I, I, I look at Get Out as a studio movie and I'm looking at the studios, especially all uh, Warner Brothers, especially you could argue with it, but that this is the year of the studio horror. I, I am so impressed with the studios for allowing their directors to have a voice and do what they want to do. Tell the story they want to tell and, and not hold back on it. And that's as evidence to your point, Perry, by Get Out. Schnapp, what are your thoughts? Well, I think, uh, you know, if, I like The Void. So I'm like, you mm. know, I felt like that was one of the horror films that came out. It's a small horror mm. film. It's, you know, closed, kind of enclosed set inside a hospital. Maybe the ending doesn't, like, kick it like I wanted it mm. to. But overall, it was a fun, kind of from beyond, like, weird, you know, Cthulhu-y type of a horror film, which had a lot of really cool practical mm. effects in it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you can't really argue with, like, you know, I don't know how much, I didn't, never looked at the, box office gross of the void i think it went kind of straight to you know yeah. video rental and stuff like that maybe had a limited theatrical but you know it's 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 always great to see a film like get out make that kind of money and it deserved it, it was a really fun creepy freaky thriller horror film mm -hmm. um with some social commentary chucked in there uh and yeah year of the studio horror film i think it's just 
the that studio horror films actually were really good this year. I mean, because yeah. you go yeah, back yeah. last year, the year before, there were a bunch of releases, but they were just crummier. This mm -hmm. year, they actually got some really good films, especially with something like It, which you know took a little time to get it going, and a couple directors had to go through the mm -hmm. you know the hell of like you know of the development process, but. You know, ultimately, uh, fans of horror like us, we get a really cool, like, you know, Goonies meets a clown kind of a film. Maybe it wasn't as scary as everybody wanted it to be, but I thought it was perfect. So. Yeah, you know, so I love, you guys are bringing up some great points, and I want to bring up the idea of consistently good studio releases, right? Because I can look at this list here of, you know, indie films that have come out, and Hounds of Love hit VOD way earlier this year. It's an Australian film. I think it's excellent. Um, I think it was poised to be a breakout hit, and yet it didn't really quite cross over into the mainstream. And I wonder if that's because all of the buzz and the air was sucked out of the room because you have stuff like Get Out, you have stuff like It, you have stuff, but, the but then at the same time, certain things failing to make a mark. I think that uh, Life, which came out by from Sony, Alien Thriller, I certainly enjoyed, but it did not make a mark. The mm -hmm. Mummy crashed and burned here in the US. But what do you think, like were there indie movies that do you think the air got sucked out of the conversation because there was so much consistent wide release film? Well, I think it's a good point because, I, and I tend to agree with you that it it does that it did get its air sucked out because all we were talking about for a long time was Split and then right. Get Out, and then now we're back with it. We were even talking about Annabelle for a lot yep. for a while. Right. I mean, and these are movies that have been at the top of the box office. I mean, it's been in the top five ever since it debuted. Annabelle Creation was also in the top five for so long. And these are domestically $300 million hits. And that's what everybody's talking about. Now, I'm maybe a little biased because I'm the producer of Movie Talk, and so I'm, I'm noticing these stories and we keep talking about them and the, and the genre movies that, that are, not the genre movies, the, the independent movies, we're not talking about them a lot. And to your other point, like the Babadook, I remember everybody talking about the Babadook and I had to seek that out and find it. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a movie, the one movie I can think of is uh, It Came at Night. Mm -hmm. And I had to seek that out and boy was I disappointed, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. I did not like that movie at all. Um, and that was the last thing I said. So I really do believe it's been, the air was sucked out. These big studio movies have captured the conversation. I also think the releases of some of these smaller films, like I loved Raw, and mm -hmm. I know we talked about it a little bit, you know, and it, it's a fantastic film. It didn't get a wide release. Mm -hmm. All the people who did see it pretty much loved it or hated it. It had like a, you know, there were no middle people. I don't, I don't think maybe there was people that kind of liked it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I was kind of feeling cannibalistic, but uh, yeah, that that's another film that came out this year that really didn't get that kind of big buzz mm -hmm. going because we did have all these bigger movies or like you know regardless as to whether split or uh get out had a lower budget they made a ton of money so they were smaller horror films made by a large studio so that means they get that kind of play where they're released in three thousand exactly. screens exactly mm -hmm. so they had no studio competition. distribution yeah. Yeah. yeah and and i think perry you bring up a great point uh, it's hard to say you know indie versus studio right because yes blumhouse is making super small budget movies but they have universal's distribution behind mm -hmm. them right i mean really you have to give jason blum all the credit in the world mm -hmm. he built that thing with such a brilliant model that's able to sustain itself coming up with these ingenious ideas making movies that people want to see for really tiny budgets production budgets at least and then striking a deal with Universal to make sure these movies could get out there I really think he might be the perfect balance between indie and studio working together to make the most profitable scenarios and I think we're just really fortunate this year that they're churning out great films and you know you brought up Hounds of Love mm -hmm. and my heart broke a little because I loved that movie and I forgot about it. And I feel terrible for that. I I do think it's it's partially because the wider releases are getting more attention this year and they're making more money. And then in my mind I said, Oh, like, but if you go back to last year, I'm sure it probably balances out to the same exact thing. Probably not though, no. because when we're talking about it, get out and split in particular, 
we're talking about a colossal amount of money, a highly unusual amount of money for wide horror releases to make. So, I mean, really, you just have to look at it. It is now the highest earning R-rated movie, R-rated horror movie ever. It, it made, well, I'm not going to get into the inflation thing, sure, sure. but you, you know what I'm getting at. This thing made a ton of money, and... Yeah, I could see it kind of sucking the air out of the room and maybe overshadowing some of those smaller ones that people would have felt the need to seek out. Well, so I want to throw... Sorry, were you going to say something? No, I, I, it, it kind of goes to a point with, like, two points that have been made about, like, taking the air out. You have the studio backing, right? But then Get Out especially, and to a certain degree, Split, they feel like independent movies. They feel like they're very intimate, and they've made, they were made on a smaller budget by studio standards but then pulled in all this money if you take a raw and you get a studio behind it and put it out there would it find success in this renaissance of horror movies that was the question that came to my mind well and raw is a really is an interesting case because raw is and we talked about this on nightmares previously and i think it's important to know because it is streaming on netflix now so you can watch it um you know raw i think is a coming of age movie that happens to have horror elements right mm. so uh, not to say that it's more one than the other but i think people who are going into this movie expecting it to be a cannibal, you know, violent, over-the-top traditional horror movie might have been disappointed, in addition to the fact that it is in French. So for the U.S. audience, you know, they you do have to read subtitles, right? Right, right. Um, but I want to point out, too, like, usually at the end of the year, if I am tasked with making a top 10, I can maybe write out, like, 12, 14 movies where I'm like, yeah, maybe these would be in my top 10. I have a list here that's probably 30 movies long where I liked most of them. That came out this year? That came out this year, nice. yeah. And, um, you know, some stuff that didn't break through, like a, like a Cure for Wellness. Schnepp, I know you like that yeah, one. Yeah, I like so it. So does yeah. Riley. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on that I like one? that as well. So all of us dig it, but... Again, this is a movie that did get a wide release and completely torpedoed at yep. the box office, yeah. but it is a weird type of horror movie. Giant budget, too. It, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of money they spent on that film. It's beautiful. It looks beautiful. And it shows. Yeah. yeah, and it's different, and it's interesting, but then that pretty much answered my point. Raw being, a, I think, a bad example because it is in French, but like Cure for Wellness gets the studio backing, gets released in all these theaters, and tanks. And well, it was a different... Well, you can also make the same comparison to It Comes at Night because like The Witch, that was an A24 release. Sure. And A24, it's not on the borderline of being a, you know, a, the same scale of a studio distribution platform, but A24 is becoming very well known for releasing movies that are unique but wind up becoming, you know, I guess you could call them sleeper hits in a way. And yep. I'm sure they were thinking, It Comes a Night is going to be on the witch track. And, you, you know, marketing might have hurt that because I oh, think totally. people went in and their expectations weren't met. That, totally fair. Um, Wayne Naylor, who is at Approximation on Twitter, said, favorite performance of the year that no one is talking about, Stephen Curry and Emma Booth in Hounds of Love. Oh, um, yeah. So, you know, yeah, it's it's like even these small movies that have these uh, these outstanding performances are, are sort of getting lost in the shuffle. As we sort of wind down this discussion, another one I wanted to mention, Schnepp, that we talked about a lot was Girl with All the Gifts. So oh, yeah. This is that, is that's, a, year, that's this year. I keep forgetting. <laughs> It's earlier. this year, right? Yeah. But it kind of just came and went, yeah. and it had this incredible cast. It was a great new spin on the zombie genre, and it disappeared. It just went poof. Where in any other year, I feel like that could have been our 28 days later. You know, it comes out on a right. smaller release and then revs up a little. Well, or even was... our train to Busan. Totally. I mean, look at that. Oh. You have a you have a foreign zombie movie that wound up, and and without any uh, recognizable right. distribution either. It's just that. That's one of those movies that caught on like wildfire in the best possible way. Yeah, but on Netflix or whatever. I mean, nobody saw it. And there was like playing in two theaters. That's I remember right. like, come on, let's go see this movie. It literally was played for a weekend. And it's the same with The Girl with All the Gifts. We saw it early last year before it got released here. And I was like, my God, this movie's incredible. Can't wait for people to be able to get the chance to see this. Oh, I guess they don't get a chance to see it. It's just instantly streaming, which isn't a bad thing. I think. You know, the more the more films just are able to be seen on either Hulu or Amazon and Netflix, that's just better for uh, you know people who love movies 
you know, because we get to get see it. But I feel like it's it's not that good for the people who are like small budgeted films. They're not getting their money back, so yeah. they're 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 operating at a loss. So usually, when they sell a film to one of these streaming companies, they're losing money. They never yeah. got to get the initial money back because yeah. it didn't get that money back from the the, the just no distribution. Yeah. Well, Girl with All the Gifts is streaming on Amazon Prime in the U.S. now. I know a lot of you international friends are saying, "Well, I saw Girl with All the Gifts last year," which you totally did because for some reason they just did not find a way to successfully put that movie out here in the States. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of these guys are streaming uh, now, which is awesome. I want to, before we get into, so every episode of Nightmares this week, we are all going to give you a recommendation, a special Halloween holiday recommendation for you to watch. Uh, but before we get there, I want to ask you real fast for your favorite smallish budget movie and your favorite biggish budget movie of the year do you have one? and no pressure if sure. you don't but do you have anything oh i've got it okay what is i it? know right Go off ahead. the top of my head if you're talking real low budget i'm going raw okay. but if i'm gonna put blumhouse in that category because get out only had a production budget of 4.5 million so i'm gonna put that one in there because get out i have not figured out any anywhere close to my top 10 of my top five yet but get out is always in the conversation in my head and how can i not not go with it. I mean, I don't know. How I'm a broken it, record with that one. <laughs> yeah. That that movie just makes me so freaking happy. I, I'm with you. It is going to be my uh, bigger budget movie of the year. And as far as a smaller budget movie goes, I would say I'm either tied between Devil's Candy or Hounds of Love. Mm. Um, I think they're both really interesting movies. Um, Hounds of Love, I don't think is streaming for free right now, but d go, you know, rent it, purchase it, uh, support the mm -hmm. indie filmmakers. And Devil's Candy is streaming on Netflix. If you have the opportunity to pay for that one as well, uh, definitely do it and throw, you know, the filmmakers a bone but if not and you just want to support them and uh love some good indie movies uh devil's candy for sure so on netflix you guys yeah i'm gonna jump right in with devil's candy and say that that's my favorite of the low lower budget ones and if you can i i echo that sentiment go go rent it because i would love to see it it rewarded for being such a good movie and something that was unique and uh, i just finally saw it like i think oh about a month ago and it blew my mind and it was great and then I gotta, again, it's it, it's God. I mean, I just, I've seen it three times in the theater now. Yeah. And I and like, I and the second time I saw it, I like I got to see the press screening with you guys. And then I, I and then I go see it again. And then I, it, 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 like there was a fever that started coming up. I'm like, I wanna see this movie again. And we went and saw it again. And I just had so much fun. But then I also wanna give it to Get Out, can I split? Yeah. Get Out is so deserving. <laughs> We've got can Get Out covered split? in both yeah. yeah, I know, I just got, it, but I loved either. it so much. I loved it so much for what it really was trying to do and for Jordan Peele to come out of nowhere yeah. with this and to see him, his name take off, I gotta give a special mention to Get Out. Love it, Schnepp? I would, uh, I would, for a low budget, I would definitely say The Void or Girl With All The Gifts, but that that seems like that had a bigger it budget. It had a pretty, so yeah. I might push that towards uh, just the disappointing that it didn't get uh, put out. Um, and uh, Raw, I'd also say Raw, definitely. Both of those are available on Netflix, I think, right now. And then, you know, for me, I love Get Out, but the one that I think beat it for me is It, because it was a, a film that had a lot of expectations mm -hmm. and that it met those expectations. I was just pleasantly surprised by Get Out, like, wow, this was really good. But mm -hmm. It was like, man, how are they gonna, well, it's not like they had a, a lot of competition to beat. The uh, ABC series is not scary. Right. I mean, sorry, no. if right. you watch it, Tim Curry's awesome, but everything else, like you got John Boy and all them, you know. No, it's, it's, it's just not, not attitude, yeah, no. it's very, you know, what the less said about it, the better. It's like, you know, whatever. But uh, I'm glad they were able to take that and really like, Elevate it. Now I can't wait for whatever chapter two or yeah. whatever they call it. Oh, yeah, chapter two. Yeah. It can't come soon enough. All right, so before we wrap up, we want to give you your horror movie recommendations. We're going to do it really fast because we did a lot of talking. Uh, so mine is Pumpkinhead. I Ooh. love Pumpkinhead, Stan Winston's movie. Uh, it's so good. It holds up. It's a great, fun fairy tale monster movie, and it is streaming on Amazon Prime here in the U.S. All right, go for it. All right, I'll jump in. I'm wearing the shirt. Yep, Friday the 13th. Are you surprised? No, you're not, because I love Jason. I love Crystal Lake, and I love Camp Blood. But Friday the 13th, part four, the final chapter, I revisited it as a watch of, uh, you know, my favorite Halloween movies. It really, I think, gets the tone right um, in that we finally get Jason full hockey mask. We get brutality. We get Crispin Glover. Hello, George McFly. He's amazing in it. And we get the introduction of Tommy Jarvis, which is probably... Jason's most well-known adversary, so check that out. I don't know if it's streaming, go rent it. 
I am going Nightmare Before Christmas. I love this movie to death. I kind of give it the credit of helping me get into horror at a very young age. I love the characters. I love the look. I love the songs. And still to this day, it doesn't matter how many times I watch that movie, holds up and still brings that same level of joy. I know some people are like, is it a Halloween movie? Is it a Christmas movie? You know what? It's both. It's both. <laughs> Very diplomatic schnep. I'm going to say Evil Dead 2. Yeah. Uh, the second of the Evil Dead, basically a remake of the first movie with a bigger budget, with a crazier sense of humor, a more manic, crazier Sam Raimi released upon the world, Bruce Campbell and his weird possessed hand. If you've never seen Evil Dead 2, definitely that is a Halloween film to see. I love it. All right, so you've got homework because guess what? We're going to be back tomorrow, and there is going to be a test on all those movies we just recommended. Yes. So start watching. Get your eyeballs ready. Uh, get your comfy jammies on. And uh, that's going to do it for us today. So come back tomorrow because we're here all week. Thank you very much to my panel. And uh, until next time, we will see you in your nightmare. Hey, everybody. Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed, Subscribe to Collider Video, do so right now, and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.